the morning show alongside Chrissy Holmes. The captain of the American fishing vessel that spilled oil in an ecological reserve south of St. John's admits a mistake was made. The Islander ran aground in an ecological reserve near Whitless Bay on Friday. Some dead birds were found in the area, but biologists fear the impact will be more widespread. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. This is the vessel that ran aground on Friday. It's a sword fishing boat from Fairhaven, Massachusetts. Damage is visible here on the port side of its bow. Captain Joseph Swan says that in his words, it was negligence. He didn't want to speak on camera, but he told me he should have been awake at the time. But unfortunately, rocks grinding against the Islander's hull were what woke him early Friday. Swan says a small amount of oil was spilled. The Canadian Coast Guard estimates about 15 gallons. This is the island where it happened. Green Island is south of St. John's, well inside the boundaries of the Whitless Bay Ecological Reserve. Biologists say the spill couldn't have happened at a worse time because there are plenty of mature and immature puffins and turs around right now. A biologist who leads tours in the area was one of the first people to spot and report the diesel spill. She didn't see dead birds but fears even a small spill can cause a lot of damage that's difficult to measure. So they are still able to fly and travel hundreds of miles being oiled and they could be somewhere offshore where nobody would ever see them, even if they die out there. It was a quick response team from this drilling rig off Bay Bulls that rescued the crew members of the Islander. Winkle is glad they're safe, but believes charges should be laid for ignoring measures to protect the reserve. Yes, I agree with that. I, I think they, they obviously were too close to the island. There's a 100 meter limit that no boat is supposed to enter. Transport Canada officials were on board the Islander today investigating the incident. Canadian Coast Guard officials say they were able to clean up some of the spilled oil and some has dispersed and is no longer visible. Molly Bond, Whale and Puffins Tours, says its customers come here to see wildlife in a pristine environment. The company's owners fear stories like this will be bad for business. Mark Quinn, CBC News, Whitless Bay. Well, there are lots of questions swirling around the Avalon Expo sci-fi convention after a bizarre series of events. One of the main stars tweeted that he wasn't paid. The organizer went missing and the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary got involved. Here now is Jeremy Eaton sorts it out. All right, these bar stools will have to be removed. On Star Trek's Deep Space Nine, Odo, played by actor René Aubergenois, runs a tight ship. The actor tours North America meeting fans for a show that ended nearly 20 years ago. Everything seems fine in this picture taken and sheared by Avalon Expo on Friday. That's organizer Jeff Power on the left, Aubergenois on the right. The Comic-Con was well received by fans. One vendor even told CBC it was a very enjoyable time. But the fun seemed to end when Aubert Jeanois checked out of his hotel. The actor tweeted out that he couldn't find power and that he had been stiffed. But he made sure he thanked volunteers and fans. Twitter users responded. One even offered Aubert Jeanois a place to stay and a tour of the city. Then the story, like Aubert Jeanois' character on Deep Space Nine, took an unexpected shift. Event organizer Jeff Power went missing. Those concerned for his safety went to the police. The Royal Newfoundland Constabulary confirmed a report had been filed, but late today, police told CBC he had been found. We made multiple requests to the organizers of Avalon Expo to try and figure out what exactly happened. Now calls, emails, and social media messages to Power all went unanswered. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News. St. John's. Well, he scratched his set for life ticket one day and quit his job the next. You're looking at the latest lottery winners from this province. Uh, that was Albert Coates. There they are again. And his partner, Wanda McDonald from Gander Bay. They picked up their winnings today. Albert says he was sitting in a hotel after a long day at work away from home when he scratched his lottery ticket and realized he'd won a choice of between $1,000 a week for 25 years or a lump sum payment of six. $675,000. He opted for the one-time payout. Well, students from this province came second yesterday in an international high-speed technology competition. 
The Paradigm team from Memorial University, the College of the North Atlantic, and Boston's Northeastern University lost out to the Technical University of Munich in the SpaceX Hyperloop competition. The competition involved designing a futuristic pod for that system. The winning pod hit a speed of 324 kilometers an hour. Paradigm's top speed was 101 kilometers an hour. They were the only team from North America to make it into the finals. Bravo for them. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, no, and uh, hopefully in the coming days, uh, we'll be able to reach out to them and find out a little bit more because I know they've spent two years working to get here and developing the technology of the future. So. They were up against some big institutions, MIT and all, oh, yeah, all no, the way down. <laughs> absolutely. And uh, yeah, once again, Newfoundlanders proving that they can uh, punch above their weight class when it comes to this sort of engineering and technology. And something else we want to update you on. On Friday's show, we introduced you to 24-year-old Alana Murphy. And you'll remember that she was the big Terry Clark super fan. Just so excited. That's an understatement. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks to local band The Narrows, Alana got to meet Terry Clark Saturday before the country superstar performed at the Eastbound Hoedown in Avondale. Clark saw our story and said Alana sings her hit Better Things to Do Better Than She Does. Clark also posed for pictures and signed Alana's guitar. But it didn't end there. <laughs> got a special shout out from her new cowboy boot wearing BFF. Uh, Terry Clark invited her onto the stage to join her for a couple of songs. <laughs> Needless to say, it was a big day for Alana. Absolutely. So happy for her. <laughs> oh, that is so cool. I don't think she's going to forget about that night for uh, quite a long time. And how about the class of Terry Clark? Absolutely. Well, and of course the night didn't end there. Here she is sound asleep <laughs> under a big white cowboy hat, which was a gift from Terry. And we're told she fell asleep wearing her cowboy boots and her all access pass. <laughs> Well, up next, a former coach and hockey instructor, Newfoundland and Labrador, is named in a lawsuit alleging he sexually abused a young player. And still to come, a daughter's memory is honored through a horse therapy program for people going through mental health problems. We'll tell you all about that later.
sliding into place ever so quickly. You're always stealing <laughs> away the, uh, the hidden behind the camera. <laughs> well, okay. and you just couldn't tear yourself away from all of this Hurricane Harvey stuff. That That's true. The pictures, the, it's, the stories, it's amazing. It is, it really is. And uh, b before we get to the weather, we want to check in with another Newfoundlander who's dealing with Hurricane Harvey. Uh, this is Paula Mossman. Mossman? 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 Mossman, uh, who was originally from central Newfoundland, uh, actually reached out on my Facebook page. That's how we got in contact with her. Uh, yeah. Moved to Houston in the 1990s. Uh, she's keeping an eye on the water levels as it creeps closer and closer to her, her home. Many neighborhoods underwater, so many people can't get out because this, I don't think it was expected that we would get pounded by this and the storm would sit over us like it has. Okay. This is, I don't know if you can see it very well. Absolutely, yeah. This is my street. This is Moss Point, and it's, that's the end of the road out there is Cypress Wood, and um, Spring Creek has flooded. This water is only, you know, a couple houses down. How worried are you that you might have to evacuate? Uh, I don't know. I'm, we're, I hate to say that because I don't want to jinx myself. I don't think we will have to evacuate our house, but we didn't expect this magnitude. When the dust settles and when the water recedes is when the when it's gonna start, and it's gonna be it's gonna be a huge mess. What's it like seeing your neighborhood, an area that you're really familiar with, completely changed and just covered in water? Oh my God, I. My husband told me to come out this morning and look at the water, and he said it's up to the stop sign. I didn't think really anything of it. And I came out, and I just, I don't know. It made me sick. I felt, I feel like crying. I know so many people already that have lost everything. And then seeing the water through downtown Houston, the freeways that I travel on, they're underwater, and it's just absolutely unbelievably devastating you just can't even you can't even imagine the magnitude of it it's just, the pictures on tv they it doesn't do it justice at all it's just it's just devastating and unbelievable and i i, I don't know what else to say it's just just horrible well, stay safe and good luck, and I hope uh, everything turns out okay. Well, thanks for contacting me, and hi to everybody in Newfoundland, and kiss the ground for me, would you? <laughs> Devastating and unbelievable. Yeah. No true words were spoken about that terrible storm. Yeah. yeah, and the storm continues. You know, typically when a hurricane makes landfall, it makes a huge impact, and then it moves inland and dissipates. Harvey has just run into basically a brick wall. And so it's just sitting and spinning. And of course, with the Gulf of Mexico, as warm as your bath, it's continuing to get fuel from the Gulf of Mexico. And it's pulling moisture out of the Gulf and just dumping it into Houston and across Southeast Texas. This is the latest satellite picture. The last frame cuts on, out, unfortunately, but notice the white cloud tops. They're bubbling up over the Houston area, starting to see the heaviest rainfall now in Houston since last night. So it's really starting to add up again. Uh, still a tropical storm, even though the center of the system is actually over land. It will likely wander back over water tonight gaining a little bit of energy from that and continuing again to rain itself out right through Thursday into Friday. And that's why we're talking about perhaps as much as 1200, 1300 millimeters uh, by the time we get to Friday, perhaps even more locally. Also keeping an eye on this system, uh, potential tropical storm 10 and the National Hurricane Center keeping an eye on this thing. It's struggling. Wind shear is in the upper levels blowing it apart so it doesn't look much like a tropical storm and it's not uh, but it is certainly has tropical origins. There's a lot of moisture with that and it is going to start to work northeastward through this week and we have our eyes on that for Thursday into Friday with some potential rainfall for southeastern parts of Newfoundland. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. Your current temperatures, it's been a pretty nice day and it's going to be a nice day tomorrow and even Wednesday. Uh, it's Thursday into Friday again where we could turn a little on the damp side.
Note those winds. Bit of a sea breeze today across Metro uh, and along the coastline of Newfoundland. That'll be the story uh, once again for tomorrow. In fact, the sea breeze really kicks in into the afternoon as winds become northeasterly. Area of high pressure holding on. Bit of cloud cover this morning has been clearing out for uh, the Avalon thickened back up a little bit for this afternoon, and we're generally going to see that uh, uh, partly cloudy sky through this evening into the overnight. And by the time we get to Tuesday morning, it's actually a bright start right through across the province. Low lying areas last night in Badger dipped to 0 0.9. Not quite the freezing mark, but boy, it's pretty close. And tonight uh, into tomorrow morning, we are once again going to be uh, close to that. Uh, unfortunately, those uh, totals, uh, are those numbers not quite accurate. Uh, in fact, Grand Falls winds are likely dip uh, closer to the uh, six degree mark, low lying areas near three. So keeping that in mind for tomorrow. Now, as we uh, look ahead to Tomorrow, we are looking at uh, that northeasterly wind becoming more pronounced into the afternoon. So keeping that in mind, we're likely going to be seeing temperatures in the St. John's area uh, near 16 degrees. Uh, and in fact, uh, unfortunately, this this map uh, not quite refreshing properly. So we'll take a closer look at uh, Tuesday uh, in my next hit when I make sure that these numbers are correct because we're actually going to have sunshine tomorrow. So we'll make sure that the scene is refreshed and I'll have a Closer look at Tuesday and, of course, a look to that system on Thursday into Friday. In fact, I can do that for you now. Note this area of high pressure staying uh, nice into Wednesday. It's as that Thursday, Friday system moves in that we're keeping an eye on that potential tropical system. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday details in more detail in just a few minutes. Peter. Thanks, Ryan. Well, a former hockey coach and hockey instructor in this province has again been named in a lawsuit alleging he sexually assaulted a young hockey player. A statement of claim was filed this month in Supreme Court in St. John's against the Avalon Minor Hockey Association and it accuses Rick Babstock of sexually abusing the player on a road trip. Here now is Glenn Payette reports. For years, Rick Babstock was a renowned hockey coach and instructor. Now he has again been named in a lawsuit alleging he sexually abused a boy in a hotel in the mid-80s. When contacted by phone, Babstock said, That's foolish. What allegedly happened is laid out in graphic detail in a statement of claim filed in Supreme Court this month. Babstock says he didn't know about the lawsuit and when given the details, denied the allegations. I don't know what you're talking about. I, you know, I can't recall anything of that nature. God almighty. James Locke is the alleged victim's lawyer. It occurred in a, in a hotel room while, while my client was uh, participating in an out-of-province hockey tournament. Um, and as he described is that he was in bed. He, he actually was sharing a room with, with, uh, with the coach. Uh, he was he was in bed. It was late at night. Um, he was actually asleep, and he awoke to uh, his abuser in the bed with him. The statement of claim says Babstock sexually abused the boy twice on the trip, and that the rooming arrangement was orchestrated by Rick Babstock in his capacity as coach and team manager. Nothing has been proven against Babstock. The complainant is now in his 40s. Locke says his client spotted Babstock in a rink several years ago. He's been dealing with the memories of it his whole life, um, but again, seeing, seeing his abuser uh, brought this back to the forefront. Locke says the impact of the alleged abuse on his client has been traumatic. He suffered very, uh, several mental, mental health issues. Um, he's dealt with social anxiety, stress. He's had some su uh, suicidal ideation. Um, and this, as well as uh, uh, substance abuse, the overuse of alcohol in some some situations and this has impacted all aspects of his life both uh, personal and professional. Seven years ago here and now had the story of Chris Spencer a man in Ontario who said he had been sexually abused by Babstock at a hockey school. He proceeded to uh, become physically and sexually uh, aggressive with me. Spencer sued and an out-of-court settlement was reached without finding a fault. That means neither the hockey school nor the college where it was held nor Babstock admitted to doing anything wrong and there was no proof or finding that anything wrong happened. But Spencer did receive money from the hockey school, the college and Babstock. As to the latest allegations, Babstock says... I'll have to talk with, with, with a solicitor. That's, that's all I can do. Right. 
As mentioned, Babstock is named as the alleged abuser in the lawsuit, but it's actually the Avalon Minor Hockey Association that's being sued. According to the complainant's lawyer, Locke, that's because the association was responsible for Babstock as a coach and manager. Now, the Avalon Minor Hockey Association comes under the auspices of Hockey NL. Hockey NL isn't commenting because the matter is before the courts. Glenn Pay at CBC News. St. John's. Up next, we go live to Ottawa for the latest on the cabinet shuffle that saw Newfoundland MP Seamus O'Regan become a member of Justin Trudeau's front bench. Stay with us. Welcome back to Here and Now. Justin Trudeau's cabinet underwent a significant shuffle today, one that was bigger than expected. At a ceremony in Rideau Hall in Ottawa this afternoon, the federal government shook up a number of key posts. And with all the details, we're joined now by the CBC's Julie Van Dusen. So Julie, what was the biggest change today? Well, the biggest change came to the Indigenous portfolio, which has been held by Carolyn Bennett for the last two years. Debbie, they're basically blowing it up into two portfolios, two departments, um, and each department will have a different role. Carolyn Bennett from now on will be dealing with the 
uh, self-government, nation-to-nation -nation relationship with First Nations. Uh, and, and this is a, like a whole new approach, and especially getting rid of the Indian Act, which First Nations have been asking for for years, many of them. And Jane Philpott, uh, who's been a pretty high-profile health minister, she will be dealing with the services that are provided on reserve. Um, so boil water advisories, health services, uh, nutrition, housing. I mean, there is so much. Uh, now, the prime minister says, why is this happening? Well, the, they talk about the $8.4 that was uh, put towards First Nations in the last budget. A lot of it is getting clogged up. It's a very unwieldy system that currently exists. He talked about the colonial paternalistic approach that is ingrained in government, and certainly First Nations have been saying this for years. So really, he says, this is the way forward. So take a listen to Justin Trudeau. If we truly want to move forward in true partnership, in reconciliation, uh, we need to allow uh, the uh, good folks in the public service, the, uh, government itself and Canadians uh, to look differently at the relationship with Indigenous peoples, at uh, the way we deliver services on the one hand, but also as the way we build a true Crown Indigenous relationships. And so a lot of attention obviously being focused in that area today. But Julie, people in this province were particularly interested to see who would be our regional representative in cabinet. Turns out it's Seamus O'Regan. Just talk about that and his well-known friendship with the PM. Well, yes, I mean, everybody was wondering what would happen when Judy Foote uh, left last week. Uh, so certainly her portfolio is a big one. It's being filled by Carla Quoltro, the former sports minister. But yes, I mean, big attention put on Seamus O'Regan. He is a longtime friend of the prime minister. We kind of know that. He certainly uh, vacationed last December at the Aga Khan's private island. Uh, he was there uh, with the prime minister and his family and some other friends. So there were questions to Seamus O'Regan as the new Veterans Affairs Minister. What about your friendship with the Prime Minister? Does that make it kind of, uh, you know, some the opposition certainly would be criticizing that he elevates his friends. And what about that whole issue he had uh, going into rehab with his problems with alcoholism? But he said, you know, my medical team says I'm, I'm ready. Uh, this is phenomenal work for me. This is a sweet day for me. Uh, he was very excited. He had uh, friends, uh, certainly in the audience, a whole kind of Newfoundland uh, Labrador contingent sitting in the audience there supporting him. So he seemed to be extremely happy. And, uh, you know, Debbie, this is a big shuffle. And all those ministers you saw there today, they're going to have to crash read a lot of books and get ready for their new portfolios because the House does come back next month. The steep learning curve for all of these new ministers, including Seamus O'Regan. Uh, we had a clip of him earlier in the program, and uh, Julie, he did seem extremely happy. You were there at the scrum. Uh, things looked good in your eye? Well, I mean, we were wondering if he if that would be a question for him if he would be asked about that because it is a big portfolio the veterans affairs mm -hmm. portfolio and kent hare uh had it for two years it's seen as a bit of a demotion for him to go down to sports uh but seamus o'regan certainly um you know said that he he grew up near a military base uh, his brothers in uh, the military that he has a lot of compassion uh, for the whole issue so, uh, and he's certainly an excellent communicator from all his years in broadcasting at Canada AM. So, um, I think um, in general, he, he fielded the questions, he acquitted himself, and uh, he's probably going to be one of those ministers that uh, we'll see a lot of because he's comfortable with the media. Julie, thank you so much for joining us. And that is our Julie Van Dusen, senior reporter at CBC's Parliamentary Bureau in Ottawa. You're welcome. Well, what's it like to leave home with your cat, your clothes, and not much else? We'll speak with another of the Newfoundlanders in Texas dealing with flooding from Hurricane Harvey.
Well, throughout the show, we've been checking in on Newfoundlanders and Labradorians in Texas affected by Hurricane Harvey. Yeah, that's right. And Jennifer Ivany Boisvert is originally from Grand Falls, Windsor, but for the last decade, she's lived just outside of Houston. Yeah, when the water started to rise, she just had to leave. I was thinking, okay, well, I'm here by myself. I'm in a one-level home. Um, and kindly enough, my ex-husband drove over as far as he could. He lives about 10 minutes from me, a little higher ground. Um, and uh, we walked out of my house yesterday morning. Um, when I got to the street, the water was already up to my knees. And uh, in places, we had to cross water that were, was up to our hips. So I have my cat up here, it was just like you see on the news, and he was carrying my little bag with my papers and a couple items of clothing, and we left. How much water did you have to wade through? Um, the deepest that we encountered was up to almost up to my hips at that point. Um, but if I look at my street now with the elevation of my house and, and where it was yesterday when we left, I would think if I left this morning, it would probably be waist or higher. Wow. And yeah. This wasn't just a little bit of water you had to wade through. You had to wade quite a ways in order to get to his vehicle. Yeah, we, uh, he had to park about a mile and a half away from the house um, because you couldn't cross the roads um, further down than that. Um, so we walked in the rain um, probably about, um, yeah, about a mile and a half. I think the, the worst, uh, the person, the, <laughs> the worst brunt of it was taken by the poor cat. What's your house like right now? Um, as of 8 30 this morning, which is the last time that my neighbors popped out to get a photo of it, the water is right up to the bottom of the garage. Um, it looks to be down about an inch from when they took a photo before they um, had to go upstairs last night around 8 30. So, you know, I, I feel like I'm probably just like millions, literally millions of other people here in Houston when I say that today I'm super grateful to be here. Um, but also very sad for what we may lose and what others have already lost. It's a very weird place to be. Um, and on top of that, there's no end in sight. We're still looking at rain for days. It's pouring outside my window right now and windy. Um, so it's, it's, a little, it's, it's, um, it's a little heart string pulling. It's difficult. But I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm safe. I'm dry. We have an elevated level. You know, not in an area that's supposed to flood. Certainly a pretty optimistic outlook on yeah. it, considering she's got the water lapping at her front door. Mm -hmm. But yeah. she did say no end in sight. For that's she, right. Yeah. yeah, we're still talking about heavy rain right now in Texas, and that's going to continue into tomorrow and into the next day, and it really looks like it could be Friday by the time the rain departs. And that's why we're talking about over four feet of rain in some spots by the time things finish up. Uh, still looking at the tropics, I mentioned earlier, we're keeping an eye on this. This is a potential tropical storm 10. Uh, given that number, because the National Hurricane Center is keeping an eye on it. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it's having a tough time getting organized. Lots of upper level wind kind of blowing this thing apart. Has the potential still over the next 24 to 36 hours to become a tropical storm? Whether it does or not, it's likely going to have some impact on our region. Not sure whether it will have a direct impact on the island just yet, but certainly the potential is there. Already bringing some heavier rains up to southeastern parts of the U.S., and this is how it will track. There is that little window for potential strengthening over the next day or so, and then likely becoming a post-tropical system as it works up into Atlantic Canada. This is by the time we get to the Thursday-Friday time period. And again, you can see that cone of uncertainty is just south of the Avalon right now. That's what the National Hurricane Center is thinking. It could track anywhere in this cone. Again, uh, obviously some uncertainty given that it's still four or five days out, but certainly could clip southeastern Newfoundland Thursday into Friday. And we'll show you the forecast model projections on that in just a minute and how it will play out with your forecast. Area of high pressure in firm control until then, really becoming lovely through Tuesday. Again, a cool start. Low-lying areas, central western Newfoundland will dip into the low single digits, uh, low to mid single digits for tomorrow morning. As I mentioned earlier, winds becoming northeast, and this is the map I wanted to show you earlier. And uh, you can see where I think we're going to top out 16 degrees from St. John's down through the southern shore tomorrow around lunchtime. Winds become northeasterly into the afternoon. That'll actually likely have us falling back. Places like the airport, downtown, 
closer to 12 or 13 degrees into the afternoon. Get inland, get away from that northeast wind. What a beauty day, 22 to 24 degrees for inland areas of the island. Just a beautiful Tuesday afternoon for late August. And the uh, Labrador region looks fantastic as well. One of the hot spots tomorrow, Makovic at 26 degrees. High pressure in firm control even into Wednesday. Another fantastic day across the island. Lots of sunshine, a few clouds into the afternoon. This is the next system that's going to be rolling into Labrador. Bit of afternoon shower activity from Nain down through Labrador City. I think we're staying dry. Bit of cloud cover building through Happy Valley Goose Bay and Cartwright. And again, a pretty nice day across the island. Likely 18 degrees in St. John's. Again, a bit of a onshore flow. Thursday morning, there's the model picking up on what is uh, that likely a post tropical storm by now. Thursday afternoon, this is when we're starting to get into that potential window for some of those rains and gusty winds to come in. I'm not overly concerned about this system. It's likely if it does brush us southeastern Newfoundland again Thursday night in through Friday, more of a fall system that brings, you know, some gusty winds, a bit of rain, nothing that we haven't seen before in this neck of the woods, but certainly one that we're going to have to keep an eye on, especially if we do have some plans for outside on Friday. And I think that would be our biggest impact Thursday night into Friday. The other thing it does bring is a big northerly wind in behind. That's why we see our temperature drop Saturday cool temps, bit of rain in behind, and then recovering nicely Sunday. And of course, it's the long weekend, so keeping an eye on Monday as well, which does continue to show uh, some milder temps. And there's Labrador again, cool down Thursday, Friday, recovering nicely through the weekend there as well. Let's meet our young athlete of the day. This is seven-year-old Jaden Marr from Paradise. Yep, Jaden received his green belt in Taekwondo this past spring. Here he is pictured with his instructor, Ian Crocker. Way to go, Jaden. You're today's Young Athlete of the Day. Well, up next, the story of a program that's using horses to provide therapy to people struggling through mental health problems. It's in memory of a young woman who ended her life four years ago. Welcome back. 
Well, when 25-year-old Alison Walsh ended her life four years ago, family and friends wanted her legacy to live on. Now, her horse Tinker is being used to help others struggling with mental health issues. Yeah, it's all thanks to a therapy program in Portugal Cove St. Phillips called Spirit Horse. Now, Saturday marked the opening of Spirit Horse's new year-round facility. Have a look. No matter how bad your day is today, if you can just get through that day, tomorrow is another day, and there's always hope. As long as there's life, there's hope. And uh, unfortunately, Alison lost her battle. Uh, she had fought many a day and many an hour and many a night, but that day she lost her battle. And I think that if she hadn't that day that she might have lived, you know, if things hadn't happened the way they did that day, she may have lived to fight on. So people really that are suffering, if they could only know that there is so much help available, stuff like this, you know, with the, the Spirit Horse program, I know she'd be really proud of it. You know, my horse, I can just hear her say it now, right? Uh, yes, she'd be very proud, very proud of it. She'd love it. And she also loved the idea of Erin Gallant looking after her horse. I felt close to how she passed away and, and just to the fact that I have mental illness too and she had mental illness and that we were connected by horses. And you know, things come up in life that you don't even realize this is why you're supposed to be doing it. And here I am. <laughs> Well, horses automatically um, are calming. They live in the moment. They don't judge. So when someone walks in the arena who is just feeling horrible about themselves, they immediately cheer us up. A lovely wow. story. Now, and Spirit Horse offers a variety of services from pony rides to lessons, birthday parties, therapeutic recreation, in addition to their mental health programs. And you can find more information at spirithorsenl.com. Well, in national news, Ontario's provincial police say they've made the largest drug bust in the force's history. More than 1,000 kilograms of nearly pure cocaine has been seized. The investigation followed the cocaine from Argentina to the port of Montreal, where it was sent to Ontario to be distributed. The street value of the cocaine? Approximately $250 million. Well, B.C. Premier John Horgan and his Minister for Forests are touring several areas of the interior where aggressive wildfires have forced out residents. One of the major blazes is about 25 kilometres east of Kelowna. It's grown by several hundred hectares since last week. Some evacuees were allowed to return to their homes over the weekend, but about 400 people are still displaced and many are frustrated. Even though their homes are not directly threatened by the flames, they still can't get back to check on their animals. Okay. Well, Corey Hart delighted fans when he performed Sonny's Dream over the weekend at Atlantic Fest. Hart, who has sold 16 million records worldwide, opened for Blake Shelton on Saturday evening in Grand Falls, Windsor. Hart told the audience that he heard the Ron Hines song a long time ago and it spoke to him. He says once he became a father, he stopped making records and stayed home with his family. That song touches everybody. <laughs> Wonderful re reaction from the crowd too. <laughs>
Well, talk about up close and personal. Just check this out. Get it out of the water quick. Roger Mayette, a town councilor in Holyrood, took his relatives from New York out to catch cod on the weekend. They were close to shore when they hooked some cod, but then, as you saw, a shark burst onto the scene and went after their fish. Mayette says the shark was about two to three meters long. I used to swim out there. I can't, never again. <laughs> Hi. Just you passing by, Debbie. Just <laughs> passing by. All right. Speaking of cod fishing, uh, what would you do the day after your wedding? Ooh. <laughs> Seriously, well, she is well. wearing her wedding dress. Trace Stegg <laughs> sent this to me, said, thanks for the awesome weather Sunday, allowed this new bride visiting from Newtown, uh, visiting Newtown from Alberta to go out cod fishing on her honeymoon. Oh, she wow. got married Saturday night, went out for a fish on Sunday. <laughs> I guess Fantastic. that's the something blue that she wore for her wedding. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great shot. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. See you tomorrow. Good night. Good night. <laughs> nice.